Okay, I'm with uh, Mel Rodriguez uh, III, and you are the um, uh, writer, producer, or sorry, writer and director of In Stereo. Yeah. And we saw that last at uh, Dance of the Films. It's coming out in theaters uh, July 3rd and on VOD as well. So uh, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. All right, well, can you tell us what uh, In Stereo is about? Well, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, what it is at heart, I guess, it's about it's about people bouncing around in, in, in their 20s and 30s making bad choices <laughs> um, as they sort of find their way through through life. Uh, specifically, it's about a couple of 30-somethings, David, a frustrated photographer, um, and Brenda, who's an embittered actress. And when we meet them, they're in a relationship until Brenda asks, you know, pops that question, you want to move in together, and that sort of freaks them out. It freaks David out, at least. And then we cut to a year and a half later, and we see that they've broken up about that. And we end it with each of them in sort of a broken-up kind of narrative. You see David first, and then, you know, you see Brenda, David's story, where we see what's going on with him. You seeing a new girl, kind of figuring his way through a kind of photography project that he's trying to make. And then we visit with Brenda, and we see that she wants a really good commodity, hot commodity as an actor, and then she sort of cleaned out because of her attitude. Uh-huh. But she's clearly not in a great place mentally. And then we, you know, they, they, they hook up. They see each other again on the street after a year and a half. And there's something clearly still there. And we, we sort of start investigating the, um, I guess, the, the modern relationship and how people are trying to find ways to, to, to exist and not turn into, you know, their parents, I guess. A lot of thrashing around. And some of it's based on immaturity. Some of it's based on just insecurity about, you know, people, everyone's getting divorced. You know, it's the fact, not everybody, but you know, half of people are getting divorced, and people of my generation are kind of wondering, you know, is it is it is it thing to do? Just go out, get a partner, and have a family, and, and, and just get on with it. Whereas there are questions that come with that, as, as, as far as complacency and wanting to continue to be able to thrive, and not just uh, feel like you know you're servicing you know a day job and servicing all the needs of, of a child only, and how do you sort of identify as a human being, as an individual, and it's all these sort of societal pressures, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's I... kind of heavy when I, when I put it that way, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that, that's one thing I picked up was that this is not your traditional love story, and um, it doesn't go down a, a traditional path of, uh, you know, you, you not only look at the lives of uh, your two main characters, but uh, even a, a little bit of your supporting cast as well. Um, what, what right, is this? yeah, no, I was never into Oh, I'm sorry. Go oh, I was going to ask you what the significance of the title in stereo was. Well, that's an interesting one. You know, I remember writing a phrase in the writing of it where I, 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 um, I remember watching some, you know, watching some film that employed an interesting sort of structure with the sound design. And I thought there was a way to kind of do that in a way that held, that is done with sound and uh, and visuals. Mm-hmm. Originally, I had really intended to, intended to really stylize the hell out of this movie in a way that was shot with you know, really symmetrical looking shots and right. and and uh, you know really created the production design to where you could you could uh, it was like symmetrical uh, design as well as you know uh, wide angles and kind of play on the stereo, the left and right and sort of the, 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 that kind of stuff visually as well as uh, with some interesting sound design, but, you know, that stuff takes a lot of time and money, and mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> those two things that may as well be unicorns on an indie set, you know, you just don't have either. <laughs> so you you have to kind of, you kind of have to adjust, and so I, I still wanted to keep that metaphor alive, and I remember just writing some sentence I was writing, I was sort of doing this, the monologue, the VO of David that he's following Jennifer, and it's sort of a perspective shift, you know, when you're seeing something from a different mm-hmm. angle, it's almost as if you're hearing the white speaker, you know, as you're listening to some good music where you get mixed in a way where you hear the horns on the right side or the drums right. on the left side. And, you know, you're finding out something new from from wherever it is that you're standing. And but it's sort of a rocky metaphor, I'll admit. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it was enough to it was enough to play with with, uh, with an experimentation uh, with the with the with the spirit of experimentation that I was entering into the film. I wanted to take something a little different, as you can as you can see. It's, like you said yourself, it's not a typical love story. I wasn't interested in making a love story. I don't. I don't much like love stories. Yeah. I don't much like romantic comedies. 
But I do love Woody Allen films, and I like I love Woody, Mike Nichols films. You know, those, those guys, they don't make movies, they don't make romantic comedies. They make films about the human condition right. that involve love and, and loss and stuff. And that's kind of what, what I was trying to do, you know. And you, know, you end up you end up incorporating a little of your own, you know, philosophy in there. But for the most part, it's just wanting to create a piece of work that, you know, speaks to the to the to the experiences that some friends of mine had, some that I had, and mm-hmm. personalize it as much as you can to, to, to communicate a, a story that's not to, not to mention not to mention communicate a story that's easy to film. Yeah. So as a filmmaker, you have to kind of make sure you're making something that doesn't involve a lot of a lot of crazy setups and shots and uh, you know uh, special effects. So you know. Yeah, speaking of that, I mean, that's one of the things that really caught me about the film, especially uh, being an independent film, is just how well produced it is. I mean, uh, you know, you go to these film festivals, and you can definitely walk into a movie and say, well, this feels like an independent film with, uh, with the, uh, I guess, the the camera shots and things like that. But this really felt like a legitimate right. uh, big-budget film. Is Was this... Was your movie deceptively deceptively low budget, or did did you have a little more money than most people have? No, dude, <laughs> <laughs> it was very low budget. I mean, it wasn't. I was. It's not like micro budget, like you know. I don't want to speak specific numbers, but it wasn't like twenty thousand dollars, something like that. Right. But it also wasn't nearly a million. It wasn't nearly a million dollars. But you can you can take, you can take a guess from that. It was very. It was you know under way under a million. And a little bit over twenty five thousand. So, but you know, it, it, that comes from planning. And also, I mean, you can't take credit for everything. There was a great crew, and yeah. you can't take credit for everything. Also, besides the fact that you're shooting in New York City. Yeah. I mean, New York <laughs> is its own sort of production design that really, really helps. But you also have to shoot it right. And our DP was excellent. Brian Cox, the guy that I've worked with before on commercial stuff, and he's. He's my guy, and I think he really wanted to show off some stuff that he can do. And we, I gave him the shot with this movie because I knew I wanted to really do something with the camera. And he was itching to do something with the camera, so we wanted to approach this like we're making a, as big a movie as possible with, with sweeping camera moves and you know trying to do some long takes and stuff. And yeah. Stylize the movie, stylize the movie without the, without cannibalizing the you know, the, 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 the story or the or the, the, the propulsion of the narrative. We don't want to get in the way of it. We still want to stylize it. We still tell a story. It's just, it's just like, you know, we, we, want, we want to have fun making a movie, too. I mean, I love all the greats that, that really employed interesting camera use. Mm-hmm. And to the degree that I could get away with it, uh, I wanted to utilize our, our, our very limited tools um, to, make, to, make, to make it look dynamic, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it goes to show what uh, how far a little money can go to, uh, these days. Oh, yeah, uh, the jump between, you know, having $10,000 to make a film to having, you know, 200000 to make a film, you can really see the difference. I mean, you can really do something that makes that look Hollywood-style, mm-hmm. um, you know, to, to a degree, you know? It also yeah. takes the right team. Yeah. Know? Well, I mean that that's that's especially true. Uh, I mean, the other end of it also is your cast. Um, you know, it's like uh, I, I'm thinking specifically of your two leads, um, really good actors. Really, um, they play uh, like uh, I guess it's Micah um, plays a very yeah. uh, terse kind of a. Uh, uh, let me see uh, how do I describe him. Um, you know, one that kind of can get under your skin if you if you allow him to. Now, talk to us about the cast, your, your two leads. Well, yeah, no, look, these guys were given the task of playing uh, rather, you know, <laughs> some ways unlikable characters. I mean, I'll mm-hmm. admit it, I, 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 happen to, I happen to enjoy watching films with unlikable characters. I don't know what the real big deal is with people saying that, oh, I didn't like him or, you know, I, yeah, I think that oftentimes people say they don't like them. Right. That they're not liking is probably probably the actor. Yeah. Because um, I love unlikable characters. I think they're the most interesting people to watch. And if you can write something or have a, a showcase where an actor can tap into their sort of darker side, that's right. more interesting to me than, than likable heroes. I mean, it's always what I like about about films. My favorite films have the most sort of despicable characters, and not in the mo- not in the evil sort of horror type way, but more in the ones where they're morally corrupt or 
you know, selfish or, you know, have become, you know, God, have fallen from grace. You know, those are much more interesting to me to watch. And in this case, these guys are just abrasive. They're abrasive because they're sort of figuring out their lives and not satisfied. And to a degree, I can understand, you know, people probably uh, can relate to that or are uh, sick of seeing that. You know, I, I certainly know the films that, you know, you can, you can see and watch and you go, oh, I've got another one of those. <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe maybe ours is that to some people, but it is coming from a place of, of, of introspection uh, at a certain point of my life, as well as other people's lives. So I know it's not like, it's not so singular that it can't be understood or related to. And all the actors that came to it, they all they all say, look, I, I, I love, I, I've, I've been this guy, or I know this guy, or I... I, I've seen that guy. You know, the, the character of Chris is also one of my favorite characters, actually. I really love that he's this, this sort of empty shell that uh, that doesn't have a lot of his own stuff. And he's jealous right. of David, kind of, and he wants to play with David's toys. He's always messing around with his life. He's got nothing of his own, really. He's got a mm-hmm. lot of money, but nothing to call his own. Yeah. You know? So these guys, these characters, you know, when actors can do a good job with this material, I think that's when it can really kind of fly. Do a, do a bad job, but it really falls flat. I think you can't really do well. Yeah, I mean, I like characters. I mean, likable heroes, villains, whatever. You've what makes a good character is uh, the ability to connect them, connect with them in some way. Um, to sure, connect with them, and, uh, yeah, exactly. Right, and then that falls true for likable characters. You don't want a bland, likable character. You know, you want them to have a little bit of a of a uh, a flaw that you can connect with. Because hey, we're we're right. a little flawed too. Okay, so now, sure. <laughs> so now your movie's coming out. Um, it's coming out on VOD as well as well as theaters here in Southern California across the country. Um, is uh, would it have been hard to get this movie made without the VOD option, uh, VOD distribution? Uh, I think so. I mean, you know, we were lucky in the in the sense that we had one. Uh, Sole uh, backer for the film because he saw a short film that I'd made mm-hmm. um, from this material. I took I took pages out of the script and shot a short film, and uh, he really liked it. And we just got we just got lucky I was in the right place. I mean, look, yeah, it took a long time. It's not like I got lucky off the bat and suddenly I'm making the movie. I've been trying to make a film for a lot of years, and this is part of the lesson of persistence. I mean, you just you keep kind of going, and suddenly you're in a position where you're ready to do something, and you have something to show for it, and then it kind of it's kind of happens that way. But also, the VOD market has kind of taken over for the DVD market. There's no DVDs anymore, and that used to be the thing that would you know be nice, and it would, it would make the distributors and studios feel a little more comfortable when they have a movie that was hard to market or sell. They mm-hmm. can always make their money on DVD. VOD is doing that, and it's a lot easier. And so, for sure, it's, uh, it's an indie. It's for indie filmmakers. It's really it's really ideal because, you know, your movie can, if you get into the DOD uh, aggregators, if you get in with the DVD system, you know, suddenly your movie's available in 50 million households, you know? Like yeah. That. And now, so, and know, now it's coming on, get, uh, as you say, it's now, it's, and now the biggest part is the marketing push, which is, is what you're in the midst of doing. That's what we're doing. You know, the, word is, the thing is to get the word out to those 50 million people to, to be able to, you know, add, reach them, and hopefully they like this kind of stuff and they'll check it out. But that's really the hard part, you know, when you don't really have a big marketing budget. You know? So we're just doing grassroots, and hopefully word of mouth and social media and all that, you know, and that's this kind of stuff. Okay, well, that's great. Well, okay. Well, uh, congratulations. In Stereo is in theaters. I, I definitely suggest trying to see it in theater if you can, but if not, it's available on... I guess iTunes and Amazon and all the uh, the major VOD uh, distributors. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, this is Mel Rodriguez, uh, writer and director of Instereo. Yeah.